Welcome. My name is Debbie Wood. I'm an athletic trainer here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock in the sports medicine department of orthopedics. I'm part of the concussion program. Uh, today, we'd like to keep this very informal. So as we're going through and talking, please feel free to interrupt at any time with a question if you're regarding what we're talking about at that point in, in time. Do not hesitate to hold them till the end or anything like that. So with that, there will be a couple more people that might be trickling in. We're waiting for a couple of the docs who are actually in clinic. And if they join us, please just pardon them as they walk in. Uh, in the back of the room, we have uh, <laughs> Donna Pigeon. She's a physical therapist here. We have Dave Edson. He's a physical therapist here. And they have a student with them, Brian, Brian from Springfield College. Sorry about that, Brian. Uh, today, we also have Beth up here with us. She is a concussion survivor, so she is here to give us her uh, point of view on the experiences that she went through, uh, through a fairly long healing process. Um, some people go through a shorter process than what she went through, but hers is, she's got a pretty good background on what happened. So at any point, if anyone has a question for her as well regarding what she dealt with, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, so with that, we'll get started. So a definition of a concussion is that it's a traumatic brain injury. There's, there's nothing mild about a concussion anymore. We used to say that they're grade one, grade two, grade three concussions, and that's all out the window now. Um, so concussions can be caused by a direct blow to the head, a direct blow to the body that causes a motion of the head, or it can be from a fast motion of your body in which your head has to take a second to respond to. If you think about your brain as floating in liquid inside your skull, as your brain gets hit, the, the, or as your, as your skull gets hit, the brain sits still for a second, then has to move through that fluid. It can potentially hit both sides of your skull. Same thing can happen if a fast twisting motion occurs where your, your head turns fast and that brain has to take a second to float through the fluid. So you don't have to have a very severe hard hit to the head for you to sustain a concussion. You can have a blow to the body in which a whiplash motion occurs to the head, anything else like that. Um, the, you'll hear me say over and over that a lot's changed in the last five to 10 years. So we're gonna cut it down to the, the bare minimum fact. So a concussion simply is a brain injury. When we talk about athletes who are injured on the field, Someone who breaks a leg, they're visibly hurt. You're going to see a cast on their leg for potentially eight weeks on average, and it's going to be very obvious that they can't play with a broken leg. The opposite occurs with a brain injury. We can't really see anything physically going on, and it's very hard for a lot of people to understand the process that an athlete is going through during a concussion because there's no visible signs that you're seeing externally. So the big thing is that we have to think about this is a, a brain injury. There's nothing you know, mild or joking about this. All concussions are serious. Like I said, we no longer grade concussions as a grade one, grade two, or a grade three. We don't grade them at all. There is a full spectrum of concussions from mild all the way up to severe, but we don't use any of that terminology. A concussion is a concussion. Uh, you will, as, um, as concussions get going up into traumatic brain injuries, mild traumatic brain injuries, you'll hear some doctors refer to it as an MTBI, a mild traumatic brain injury, things like that. But you're not going to hear the, the mild concussion or a moderate concussion or severe or grade one, grade two, or grade three. A big one, concussions can occur without a loss of consciousness. A lot of people feel that unless you get knocked out or blackout, that you didn't have a concussion, and that's just simply not true. When we go further through the slide, you're gonna see a list of symptoms that you can have, and you can have a lot of those symptoms without ever losing consciousness. Can concussions, so concussions can occur in any sport. Um, you can have concussions in the obvious, football, hockey, lacrosse, but you can also have hockeys that are occurring in dance, uh, cheerleading, ballet, sailing, anything. You do not have to be in a contact sport to sustain a concussion, and it can occur in any part of your life. It doesn't have to occur on a sports field or ice or, or track or anything like that. And it can occur slipping on a sidewalk, uh, slipping on a set of stairs, tripping over something in your house where you fall and just land weird, anything like that. So concussions can occur in any sport, and they can occur outside of sports. One of the most important things is recognition and proper management of a concussion immediately. Very important that the immediate part is recognized. So 
If you've got someone in a football game, say you've got youngsters playing football, and someone takes a hard hit, you want to make sure that that hit is recognized, make sure that they're with it still, not showing any signs or symptoms of a concussion. And if they are, you want to immediately start managing it by pulling them out of the sports immediately. So we always say, when in doubt, sit them out. If someone possibly has sustained a concussion, do not put them back into play that day at all. And that's because symptoms of a concussion can take a while to show up. They, they're not going to walk off the field and immediately have a headache and nausea and dizziness and blurred vision and all that. They may walk off the field and just go, oh, I don't feel right. And as the next hour or two goes by, they may start to say, oh, my head's really starting to hurt. And then I mean, I'm feeling kind of nauseous. And they just start to add up. So if they've possibly sustained a concussion or had the impact or any sort of maneuver that would have sustained a concussion, pull them out of play that day and don't put them back. They need to wait until they've been cleared by a healthcare professional who has been trained in managing concussions, and that's extremely important. Um, there's unfortunately been a lot, as I've been involved in the program here at Dartmouth, I've been seeing a lot of patients coming to us who are like, well, I saw an ED doctor and they told me, after seven days I can go back to sport. Well, after seven days the patient still had symptoms, but they went back to sports anyway. You know, I've also heard, well, my primary care told me as soon as my headache's gone, I could go back to sports. Well, there's a lot more that goes in, into a concussion than just a headache. So you need to be seen by someone who has been trained to manage concussions. There's a, a numerous education out there based on those last changes that have occurred in the last five to ten years. So it's very important to see someone who's up to date on what's occurring in concussions. Are you only talking about a, an MD? Or are, you talking about are there other... There's, Primarily, if you've got someone that's sustained a concussion, you want them seen by an MD or a PA who's been seen, uh, who's been trained in, in sports concussion management. Um, at college and high school levels, there is a very good potential that your athletic trainer is going to be very up to date on it. There's also a lot of school nurses that have gone through some education too. Um, but I would, what's that? Right, right, additional practitioners, true. So APRN stuff like that. Um, but you want to. No matter what, make sure that they've had recent education to be up to date in the sports management or sports concussion management. And there's a lot of differences. Um, we talk about sports concussions, and then there's just plain concussions. So there's a difference in how we do a return to play. So someone who doesn't have to worry about being physically active um, has there's slightly different guidelines than we use for someone who's returning to a, a sport, specifically a contact sports. We graduate their return through a progress. So myths versus realities, and these are a lot of things that have changed in the past five to ten years through research. Um, so you don't have to lose consciousness to be diagnosed with a concussion. Um, they can be caused by anything, including a direct blow to the head, but it can be a direct blow to the body or just a maneuver of your body. Um, you don't need to repeatedly wake someone up who has had a concussion. So they used to say you have to wake someone up every 20 minutes, 30 minutes. You know, wake them up um, if they've sustained a concussion so that they're still alert and alive and awake. And that's not true. You want to allow them to rest. Resting is what the brain needs to heal. And if, the, if you keep interrupting that rest cycle that their brain is going through, you're interrupting that healing process. Uh, the myth used to be you can return to play after seven days of rest. That's not true anymore. Everybody heals at a different rate, and we've proved this through research and data. So some people may heal slightly faster than seven days, seven days, and some people may heal a lot longer than seven days. Uh, they used to say you have to have images of your brain to prove a concussion, a CAT scan or an MRI. That's not true. Very, very small percentages of MRIs or CAT scans are going to show up anything. I believe it's less than 1%. Um, the things that are going to show up on an MRI or a CAT scan are going to be severe things like brain bleeds, things like that. They're going to need a much stronger um, management. Dr. Carlson, you can come right up here if you want. This is Dr. Carlson. Uh, she's one of the doctors in our sports concussion management program. The next thing is, once your headache's gone, you can go back to play. That's not true. Like we said earlier, a headache is just one, one puzzle piece of a big pi picture that's going on here. Uh, the other thing we discussed was that uh, grade one concussion is no longer a big deal because we don't diagnose things as a grade one, grade two, or grade three concussions. Um, concussions only affect your physical performance. That's not true. We have a lot that goes into this. We have neurocognitive, there's uh, coordination, balance issues. There's a lot that goes into it. Uh, and then the number of concussions is not important because each concussion is short term and heals easily. It's not true. Concussions are cumulative. Uh, the, the more, the, 
the higher your incidence of concussion goes, the longer healing time it's going to take, potentially the more severe your symptoms are. Some of these things are controversial or people don't realize. I've had, I've had physicians say, well, he didn't, he didn't black out so it wasn't a concussion. And I've had physicians tell me that uh, on their referrals, you know, well, it is, you know, can't be a concussion because they didn't black out. That, that's sort of old. Um, we used to grade concussions and there was a bunch of grading systems for concussions and they included <laughs> and they, um, grading the systems for concussions in the past included made a big deal about loss of consciousness and I think that that was really difficult because how do you know you know, is it split second, this person lost consciousness, you know, and then they came to? How do you know if that's really loss of consciousness? Does that count? Does it have to be a minute? Who knows how long a minute is? If your kid is laying there and they're concussed and they're unconscious, a minute could be five. You know, you think it's five and it's actually, you know, five seconds. So they really decided to take all of the loss of consciousness stuff out of concussion. I think that's really kind of important because then it has sort of changed people's recognition of concussion because um, they thought, well, loss of consciousness means concussion. So I think that that's really, that ties together a few of these myths um, and I think really important to think about. Anybody have questions about any of the sort of myth reality? Yeah, the other thing, uh, the other thing that I, that I <clears throat> hear a lot too is this number two is, is you have to hit your head and it isn't a good thing you had a helmet on because you could, you know, would have had a concussion if you didn't have a helmet, you know, that helmets don't protect you from concussion. That a lot of the, the concussion cause of the concussion is rotational and that's not going to be fixed by, you know, hitting your head with a helmet. So it's the rotational, it's the, it's the twist and hit that made all the difference. So it's sort of um, sloshing around in the brain, thinking about the brain rearranging itself inside there, and that makes a huge difference. So here we've listed off the signs and symptoms that are very common to be seen with a concussion. Uh, and there's absolutely no rhyme or reason as to each patient and each athlete what they're going to see for signs or symptoms. So you can see there's a variance between cognitive, physical, emotional, or sleep signs and symptoms. Um, one of the key ones I feel is the mentally foggy. You can have two athletes that have both sustained a concussion, and you can ask one athlete, you know, do you feel mentally foggy? And they're going to be like, what are you talking about? And then you ask the other one, do you feel mentally foggy? And they're like, oh, that is a great description. That's exactly what I feel like. So if it, that's one of those signs that if they're going to know what you're talking about when you ask them the on that one. The thing about that is, is the patients will tell you as they're getting better, when, they, when they're post-concussion and we're seeing them back, they're like, I, just, I usually tell the patient and the parents is that you're going to know it's going to be like the window shade got lifted up. And the parents will say, yeah, my child is back. And the kids will say, yeah, I'm myself again. And that's kind of how they describe it, the fogginess. They just you know, took away that fog, and it's gone. And they're their bright, happy, witty self again. And they're not that kind of you know, dazed-looking person. Um, and that, that's a really, if you're going to look for one thing, that's, that one tends to be the most, uh, among the most useful. And it's, it's good to point out that the people surrounding the athlete or the student often will pick up on things that the athlete or student may not pick up on themselves. Uh, the key, key ones being the emotional states. Uh, and uh, jokingly, I have, you know, when I'm talking with patients a lot, I'll be like, you know, any irritability, emotional, stuff like that, and I get, oh, my, I've got a teenage child, of course they're emotional and they're irritable. Well, in relation to how they normally are, how are they now? And often the parents will say, oh, I've definitely noticed a change. And the, the student will be like, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I didn't notice anything. So often, because you're around them and you see them the most often on a daily basis, you're going to pick up on things that a doctor may not see in the office because the doctor sees them very occasionally. Coaches may pick up on stuff because the coaches know their, their athletes in and out very well. Uh, so it's very important to not rely only on the things they're telling you. You know, they can tell you they have a headache or that they're dizzy or that they have blurred vision, but it's very important to notice yourself any changes in their behavior. And, and, and like Dr. Carlson said, they'll get to that point where they're kind of back to normal. And if there's no sudden change, you'll just notice over time that they're, they're different. That is, is uh, you know, those of you can read this, and we're sorry if it's too small, but, but all of these are subjective. There's not, not a single one of these, other than irritability, really, that, that, you can, um, sell, that you can do anything other than self-rate. And the problem with that is, uh, that's actually why the kids are next door doing the impact tests, and we'll talk more about balance, is, is we don't have a 
perfect test for, yes, this person had a concussion. It's, do you have any of these symptoms? And they could lie. But a parent who knows the child well, or a coach or a fellow athlete will say, hmm, this person is just not behaving right. And, you know, I'm thinking I'm seeing some of these things. The teacher will say, you know, he's not paying attention. He's not following directions. Um, and, see, you know, it seems mentally foggy. The kids who say, I want to get back, I want to get back, I want to get back, they could lie to us on all these, every single one of these. And they try. But then we have other, we have other tricks in the bag. Do you mind telling us about what you were feeling right after you sustained your concussion? Um, well, so right after, I was at hockey camp, and I, it was a shootout, and I kind of dove for the puck, and I landed, and I kind of got whiplash, and honestly, I felt fine. Like, I was like, okay, kind of got my, the wind knocked out of me, got up, took the next shot in the shootout. Probably didn't help that I got it in the head. Um, kept going. Last shot, felt like she was going really, really fast, and I could not keep up, and I had no idea why, and I was like, okay, well, she was just going really fast. Looking back now, I realized that was the first sign I had a concussion. Um, and then I got back into the locker room and started getting undressed. You know, I was with my team, and then I started to get, music was going, which really started probably to ag aggravate my headache, and felt like stakes were being driven into my head, went back. Went to the trainers. My coach was like, yeah, you're, you're going to the trainers. Um, went to the trainers. He's like, yeah, you're pretty gla glossy-eyed. Let's just get undressed, and then you can go have some dinner and that kind of thing. Um, and my headache went away, like, in 20 minutes. Um, and then he was like, that trainer was like, oh, yeah, you'll, you'll probably be able to play tomorrow. Went back. It was like, I felt fine until the next day. When I talked to a different trainer, and he's like, oh, we're not messing around with this. You can't go back. And I was really mad at him. And um, I was watching the game. They wouldn't even let me on the bench watching the game. And I started feeling really nauseous, kind of like I had to start sitting down uh, watching the game and everything. And then um, went home because it was the last day of camp and was, decided I wanted to make some dinner or lunch. And... So I was going to make pasta, put the pot on the stove, put the pasta in, and walked away. And that was kind of like, my dad's like, um, are you going to turn the oven on, or are you going to put some water in? And so really, I mean, the headache was the only symptom, really, initially. But it took 24 hours for me to really feel the effects of the concussion. So that's something I think is pretty important, that you're not necessarily going to feel it right off. And very good point when she talked about her, her thought processes were interrupted. So her ability to think clearly and make the decisions of how to make pasta, things like that, simple things, stuff like that is what gets interrupted that you're not going to notice. You know, if we were to say, you know, how's your thought process? She may have said, well, I feel fine. But noticing things like that where she's not able to do a simple normal task, those are the signs where the cognitive gets interrupted. Yeah, that was the first sign when I was like, oh, this isn't just making me nauseous, it actually has affected my brain a yeah. lot. Okay, so moving on. Some of the things we, we really want to raise your, your eyes to are the red flags, things that you need to get to an emergency room right away. Um, so if someone's drowsy and they can't be wakened up, if they've got different sizes, pupils, and, and significant, and you'll see there's a, um, a bulletin board in the room next door that's got a good illustration of this. Um, if they're having convulsions or seizures, if they can't recognize people or places that they can normally recognize, people that they see on a daily basis and, and places that they definitely should know. Um, if they have a rapidly worsening headache or increasingly are getting confused, restless, or agitated. Uh, if they have unusual behavior that's just not themselves and comes out of nowhere. And if they lose consciousness. So one of the, one of the things uh, that keeps getting caught up, uh, brought up in the past um, on Saturday's presentation was the loss of consciousness. Uh, and the recommendations on the CDC's website is if they've lost consciousness with the possible hit that they took that might have been what the mechanism of the concussion, you know, have them evaluated. It's no longer, oh, the first time you lose consciousness, don't worry about it, it's no big deal. You know, losing consciousness is, is a significant issue and make sure it gets checked out. 
Some of the other things that you want to bring to a doctor's attention but not necessarily need to rush off to an emergency room is if they've got a headache that's getting worse but doesn't go away. Now the difference between that and the red flag is someone who has a headache that comes on for no reason. Uh, for example, I've, I've dealt with an athlete that she had a headache that was approximately about a two or a three during the morning when she got up. She went to get in the shower to get ready for school and by the time she got out of the shower, her headache was a 10. She couldn't stand up. I mean, she just worsened over the course of a 10, 15 minute shower. You know, got a phone call and, and we got her in for a CT scan right away. Everything was fine. We monitored her really closely. Everything was fine. But for some reason, why did that trigger her, her symptoms all of a sudden? So that's one of those red flags when for no reason her headache just ramped up. Um, other things are weakness, numbness, uh, decreased coordination, repeated vomiting or nausea, and slurred speech. If your body's just not acting normal, you know, make sure you're following up and, and letting your, know, your medical providers know what's going and on. So the reason for these red flags and these seek medical help are this is a person who doesn't have a concussion. This is a person who could potentially have bleeding in and around their brain. They could have a skull fracture. They could have something much more serious than a concussion. And they do need evaluation and they do need to be seen in the ED because some of those people need to be admitted on the neurosurgery service and need to have neurosurgical procedures. So these are all the, the things that we say, if you have this, you probably don't have a concussion. You've got something much more serious and much more scary. Um, and that's why they're called red flags. It's, you know, you're, you're not in, in the concussion realm anymore. You're in the, wow, we got to worry about this person realm. Um, and uh, that gets me to the CT. Was that on, was that on the myth reality? Yes. CT, um, a lot of people, you know, when they come, they bring their child into the ED because maybe they've had, you know, headaches that are worsening or something like this. And they're thinking, I don't know. Uh, and they bring them in and the emergency room, doctor evaluates them and says you don't need a CT and the parents are like well this is what's what I'm here for I need a head CT to find out if he has a concussion or not and the answer is that doesn't diagnose concussion it's really only diagnosing these much more serious much more dangerous much more worrisome problems that the ED doctor has a whole logarithm that they uh, sorry algorithm that they go through to decide whether this person needs a CT or doesn't need a CT so you can with confidence if you brought them to an ED doctor who is trained in emergency medicine and they say your child does not need a CT scan you can say okay this person doesn't need a CT scan because they've ruled out all these other worse things again that doesn't tell us if they had a concussion or not questions about that Anybody? so what are you supposed to do if, you, if you've had a concussion or your student athlete or child had a concussion you need to be seen um, hopefully within 72 hours of the injury you need to let the medical provider who is managed in sports concussions to be able to see them hopefully at their worst so that we can kind of see where they're going. So occasionally we won't see someone until they've healed and we have nothing to compare them to. And we'll get into this a little bit further why we're asking for baseline impact testing which is what some of, the, some of you guys brought children to do in the other room. Uh, and that is so that we have something to compare to. So uh, you're going to avoid any sports or physical exertion and this is because you don't want to get your heart rate and your blood pressure up and stimulate that brain even more. In addition to that you want to rest them from the mental exertions, any concentration activities, so homework, schoolwork, uh, video games, really active movies or TV shows where you've got big fight scenes and lots of flashes going on with noise and things like that. You want to keep things very calm and mellow. You don't want them walking around with headphones that are booming loud bass music, rap music or anything like that. You want it to be calm and soothing. Their brain needs to rest. Every time they're visually stimulated or stimulated via their ears or anything like that, physically as well, that brain has got to start working harder and you want to let that brain rest. Um, and like we said earlier, parents really need to advocate for their child when it comes to school because cognitive is such a major focus of concussions. They may not show it externally, but their homework grades, their test scores are going to start to show a decline that may not, they may not be describing through headaches and dizziness and, and things like that. Um, so the big thing is, you know, when in doubt, sit them out. Sit them out of that physical activity and sit them out of that mental activity. How, did you have school involvement? Yeah, well, so I got mine in July, so I got back to school, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to do school. First couple of days, we weren't even really doing any, like, cognitive school, actual school work, but um, with concussions, it affects the brain, so whatever part is damaged is or hurt is, like, that's going to show through what you're doing, so... 
I remember we were matching cards with like it was I go to the Shannon Academy, so we're like really team bonding kind of thing. But um, it was like matching cards or something, and I was like, I, I can't do this. And my teacher's like, it's easy. Come on, Beth, you can do it. And like that's one thing people, because it like she said earlier, you're not wearing a cast or anything. People think you're fine, and then like you can't do it. So that's really important, I think, to just advocate because that was real. That was probably the most difficult part was like people saying, "Come on, Beth, it's easy," and it's like already kicking me when I'm down because I'm like, I can't do this. And um, very, very often, the teachers or uh, a guidance counselor, or someone from the school, will contact the parents to let the parents know that the student's struggling and that the parents weren't even aware of it and the child wasn't really focused on it too much. Sometimes the, the, the child will point it out as well, but it often is a, a teacher bringing it to the attentions of the family saying, you know, they're slipping in grades, so something's still wrong. So we, we think we've had a concussion. We've seen all the signs. Now what do we do to diagnose this? And I keep saying that there's numerous pieces to this puzzle. So first and foremost, again, is that immediate recognition a management assessment, all that. So preferably, if you're in sports, you have someone on the sidelines of your games or your practices that are trained to know how to manage concussion. So hopefully an athletic trainer, or an EMT, or a coach, or if you're lucky enough to have a doctor on the sideline. Have an on-field assessment, and they can use a tool that's called uh, SCAT2, which stands for Sports Concussion Assessment Tool. And I've got a couple slides of that coming up in a second so you can see what that looks like. Other things that are going to occur is there's going to be a neurocognitive screening that occurs. Uh, and one of the most popular ones that are used is the impact testing. Those are the ones that are occurring in the next room over. There's also going to be a vestibular assessment to, to assess the balance. And then there's going to be some coordinations assessments. And, and people often joke that it, it looks like a, a field sobriety test. You know, a lot of you know, finger to nose and, and walking and things like that. So those are all tools that are used to help diagnose the concussion. The interesting thing about that is that you're not necessarily going to have something wrong in all of these. I'll give you an example. It was just somebody that I saw yesterday who, when he was concussed, this was a skier, um, when he was concussed at his worst, he did great on the impact test, the cognitive test. But he couldn't balance to save his life. I mean, it was pretty pathetic. And this kid is a skier, and I forget, I think he's a freestyle skier. Yes and competitive at one of the ski academies and there's no way that he should have the balance that he had and so we said wait a minute you know I don't care how well you did on that between that and your symptoms you're done so so the impact test it, you know it's a tool it's among the tools that we have in the toolbox but it's not the only tool so so to get the impression that just having the the neurocognitive test in and passing that is a kid who's ready to go back is not correct um, and By the way, I did let him go back yesterday. Balance was great. Well, that, that was the, the key thing with that one was it, was it had been a week or two since we'd seen him, yeah. and his impact scores were still great, but his balance was amazing. It was, yeah, it was it, better than, way better than average, yeah. as he should be for what he does. It's pretty interesting. So, Donna, do you have a second to come up, and I'll skip forward. So Donna's going to speak about the, um, the balance error scoring system couple minutes to tell people what's going on with the kids for the, the balance um, screen part of this. And they're all going to be doing the test that you see over here on the right. It's called the BESS. And um, basically what it involves is standing in different um, challenged balance balanced positions with their eyes closed and then the first three they're going to be on the floor and then the second three they're going to be standing on the foam so it gets progressively more difficult to hold your balance and there's been studies that show what's a normal amount of difficulty to have with that test so they're in the position and every time that they get out of the position if their leg moves or they step down or their hands come off their hip those are errors and we count the errors and then that gives them their baseline so sort of like with um, impact testing which Deb's going to talk about more um, in a bit, there are some normal ranges. And with the best testing, there are some normal ranges. But the only way that we really know if somebody is back to their baseline is to have a baseline. So that's why today we're incorporating the balance uh, baseline testing as well as the impact testing. And just so you, oh, I forgot to cover, just so you know what, how, why this is a part of um, what we're looking at with concussions, as Dr. Carlson and, and Deb said, that there are many um, parts of the brain that can be injured, and depending on where the injury is, you're going to have 
different problems. So you may never have balance problems or dizziness. That may be your only problem. You may never have cognitive problems. That may be your only problem. Um, and the, the reason that balance can be injured in a concussion is the way balance works is it's basically an input-output system. So your brain gets information from your eyes, your inner ear, and your feet basically, and gathers that information and then tells your body how to, how to balance. So if there's a concussion, you have an injury to the brain, and that processing piece of it can be, um, can be affected. And then, the, that's, and then that's how we'll see it. You also can concuss your inner ear if you hit your head. Not everybody does, but it's a possibility. So that may be contributing toward dizziness. Um, there's another um, thing that can happen with the inner ear when you hit your head called BPPV. Somebody, some of you may know about this. It's just a condition where you can get some spinning vertigo with positional change. And that's something, that particular piece of it's easily treated if, um, if that ends up being a problem. So if you do have dizziness with a concussion, it's really important that um, you know, that you make sure that the student or your child um, lets people know that so the healthcare provider is working, working with um, the child can be, um, can give appropriate treatment because there are some um, exercises and some treatment you can do if, um, if that area is injured. So everybody today, all the kids that are here will be going home with um, a paper copy of their best test. If they're in our system here, I think everybody was asked when they came in, we're going to put it in the medical record system here. So it will be, um, you know, it will be recorded if you ever need it someday. If you're not in our system here, we just ask that you keep that paper and take it to wherever you might go for follow-up. Any questions? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. So skipping back a little bit here, we're in the sports concussion assessment tool too, and I apologize, we tried to... Yeah, we tried to fit on it. It's a four-page thing. Now, it's a little intimidating. However, to go through the whole thing, it, it only takes maybe three to five minutes. Um, and this is really meant to be used by someone who's trained on how to use it, a medical professional. Uh, it can very easily be used on a sideline by an athletic trainer, or EMT, or doc. Um, but it's also set up in a format that any layman who's not trained in it could pick it up and understand it. And that's primarily because of all these the little bits of writing that you can't read. Um, it's, it explains what it is and what you're doing. Um, so it's slightly intimidating seeing it as four pages, but if you were to go onto the internet and type it up, you'd be able to see and read it that it's very user friendly and it takes very minimum time to use it. It's gonna go through and ask you symptoms and it's gonna ask alertness, response to pain, verbal response, things like that, memory. And it's just a tool to use on a sideline. There's, there's another tool out there that's also called a SAC and that's, that's kind of the older version of the SCAT. So. So the, the IMPACT testing stands for Immediate Post-Concussive Assessment and Cognitive Testing. And, and all of this information comes directly off their website, which I'll provide at the end. Uh, so the IMPACT test is approximately takes 20 minutes. Um, it's a neurocognitive test battery. So there's numerous different ways that it tests your neuroprocesses. Um, it's available for athletes aged 11 to 65. And we use the term athlete specifically because we're using it as a return to play step in our progression. Um, we don't test under 11 because of the cognitive differences that are occurring at that age and how fast people can develop. However, there is rumor that there is a program that's going to be released shortly for pediatrics for this. Um, above the age of 65, we don't test there because there's um, a, not a huge population to compare to. So what impact is, is it was created at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and it's this computerized test that's, that's housed on the internet. And every time someone takes a test, that data is collected in Pittsburgh, and it's compared against people of similar demographics. So age, sex, uh, if you have learning disabilities, ADD, dyslexia, anything like that, you're all compared to each other. And over, I believe it's over 3 million people that have taken the test right now, all of that information has been compared, so you get these normal ranges. So when people take the test, they think, you know, they come out, did I pass, did I fail? It's not a pass-fail, it's a scoring that kind of scores it against each other. Um, I'll let Dr. Carlson explain it a little bit more in a second. Just, um, so some of the stuff, if you're prior to 18 years old or still in high school, we want to get your baseline every two years because of the cognitive develop this, developments that are occurring. Beyond that, in college and as a professional athlete, uh, they say you only need to be tested once because you've no cognitively developed at that point. 
we want to try to get you tested within 24 to 72 hours to see where you're at. So we want that baseline originally, what we're doing today. We want to see you at your worst, and then we're hoping to see you again symptom-free when you're back at your best. And we want these two baselines to compare or be within normal ranges. Sometimes that, mid, that middle concussion uh, assessment, the impact in the middle, can be skipped occasionally if those two, we have the baseline and the, the ending one. Um, and then, like I said, the athlete's going to be retested when they're completely symptom-free. So Dr. Carlson can explain a little bit more on the scoring and, and the type of things that they look for. Is there a slide on that one? I, I don't have one, now. The um, uh, impact was, was, you know, they're trying to make a mini version of what was a four-hour supervised pen and paper, uh, basically, you know, exam of how, how quick are you, so mental quickness, memory, various other tasks. Example is um, you're shown something where it says, blue but the color is red and you're supposed to say what color is it not what does it say or you're supposed to answer what does it say not what color is it uh, with little red green color blindness sort of thrown out but but the example uh, that is you know just sort of a you're, you're supposed to read the word not look at the color um, and um, they I think they did a good job with this it's it's, uh, I've taken the test just to see what it's like, and, and they, they make you remember some words, and they make you remember some horrible squiggles, which everybody hates. It's like this, and then they show you ten of them, and they have to remember, did you see this one before? And you go, are you kidding me? But it's, a, it's measuring something different than verbal memory. It's called, it's called visual memory. Um, and they do some mental quickness things. They want to see how fast you're clicking the mouse. So we, had a, we actually had a computer where the mouse wasn't working, and um, we had to throw out those tests until we realized that the mouse wasn't working, and the, you know, the mouse wasn't working quickly enough because one of the things that you're being measured on is how quickly do you answer this. Um, and a lot of it is memory. You know, where were the X's and the O's in this grid? After we've distracted you with another test and bring you back to the X's and O's, and you're like, oh, shoot, where were those stupid X's and O's? And I'm um, just trying to see, you know, and so it's, it's kind of fun. It's not, it, and it's not necessarily depending. She's shaking her head. It's not All right, it's not fun if you have a concussion. <laughs> but it's kind of fun in that sort of sick kind of way of, of <laughs> medical testing. No, um, of... Um, um, you shouldn't, it's not really a test of intelligence because the words are simple and they're X's and O's and the directions are easy to understand. Do you agree with that anyway? Yeah, they're yeah. pretty easy. Um, um, the scoring is based on, on how well you recalled the, the words, how well you recalled the squiggles. Um, there's some mental quickness stuff on the X's and O's. There's some other um, reaction time stuff we're looking for and that's particularly important for an athlete in any kind of ball sport or skier where you have to have quick reaction time where you're moving quickly and things are changing quickly and you've got to react immediately and we can see significant deficits in reaction time from baseline to a post-injury test so um, those can, I mean, it's, it, it's, and it's, you know, it's nice because it's, it's a, you know, unfortunately it's a commercial product, so we have to buy it, but it's nice because they have the, all of the, you know, national data. There are other companies who have similar products, but this was the, the original, and we sort of still consider it still the best. Um, it has the most research behind it and has the most research done on it. Um, so we've been to a training course to know how to read this, and, and we'll read them, we'll interpret them. If we have concerns or questions, there's sometimes there's a complicated person who sort of gives us this kind of discordant, we can't figure out why they, why they scored so poorly over here and as well here. We have, um, as part of the, of the team, a neuropsychologist. A neuropsychologist is a person who does this kind of testing all the time. And Art Marylander is, is our consultant for this, so in, if we have any concerns or questions, we can ask Art and say, can you just look at this one and see what you think? Because there are some that aren't so straightforward. Like she said, and, and Beth probably hinted to, the con it's not very fun to take if you've got a concussion. It's very often that the um, athletes will complain that they have a lot more symptoms at the end of the test if they're, if they're in a Severity, and that's one of the yeah. things, actually, that, that it asks you your symptoms at the beginning and the same symptoms as the grid that we had there, and it asks you your symptoms at the end. And pretty much, I'm not, uh, let's, I'll give it away to you guys because you're not taking the test. If you say your symptoms are higher at the end, you fail the test. I mean, if it gave you more headache, it's pretty easy to say that you're not ready to go back to your sport. Um, don't tell your athletes that. All right. So those are the tools that we use. And, and 
and the providers will also do their own exam in the room, you know, coordination and some other stuff. So, so it always comes down to, so how do we get, how do we heal from a concussion? Um, and unfortunately, there's nothing we can do to speed up your healing process. And there's no way we can put a time stamp on it to know exactly when each person's going to be 100% healed from their concussion. It depends on numerous factors. So it depends on how severe was their concussion, how old are they, how healthy were they prior to the concussion, how many concussions have they had before, uh, and how are they also taking care of themselves. So if they're not avoiding physical activity, if they're not avoiding that concentration and the video stimulation and they're playing video games all the time, we can expect that their, their healing process may take a little bit longer. Uh, so it's very individually uh, gauged as but, to how they're going to heal. the average concussion person is better in 10 to 14 days. You sound like you're way beyond that. You're talking yeah. about return to school and still not yeah. better. So there's, there's outliers. There's folks who are way out multiple months and multiple years. <laughs> Ask Sid Crosby, the... Um, a uh, hockey player who still hasn't returned, he tried to return and he's still out because his return didn't go well. Um, but 10 to 14 days is sort of average and that's kind of what we expect. There might be the person who has a concussion, all, has all the symptoms, and the next day they're better. It's not very common, but that's possible. But you kept them out because on day one because you didn't know if they're going to be better tomorrow or not. Um, so 10 to 14 days is sort of a, a ballpark guesstimate but there's plenty who are well beyond that, and um, we can't we can't tell you, and we have no we have no test for that, right? And that was frustrating, I bet. I was I was told, oh, you'll be better in like a couple of weeks, and then it was like, yeah. oh, you'll probably be better next week, and that lasted for five months. So. Yeah. <laughs> and then the problem is that we can't we couldn't tell you at month four that you were going to be better at month five either, yeah. nor could anybody. But it is important to do the things that are going to help promote your healing. So making sure you're getting plenty of rest and avoiding the physically and the, and the concentrating activities. Uh, it's also important if you've got someone of driving age to make sure that they're clear to drive because their reaction time has been affected. So their response to being able to slam on the brakes if something cut, cuts out in front of them, that's important to make sure their reaction time has been analyzed. I had a 16-year-old ask me in front of mom if sex was okay. <laughs> The answer is no. <laughs> and on <laughs> that note, reasons. avoid the drugs and alcohol. <laughs> so return to play. And, and this, this takes a, a lot of explanation. I'm going to skim through it really quickly. But to be able to be cleared to return to play or progression of return to play, you have to be symptom free. Your impact test has to be baseline or within normal limits. And you have to be cleared by a medical professional to return to play. Uh, we're going to return you to play at 24-hour increments. Make sure that none of your symptoms return while you're active or for in that 24-hour period after you're active. First thing we're just going to do is get that heart rate up, but not jar the head at all. And if you're good with that, we're going to move it up. We're going to get your heart rate up there, but do some head movements and some full body motions. So at first, you may be doing some walking and biking, and 24 hours later, we might progress you to sports-specific activities like running or skating, things like that. You're going to go on to non-contact drills and then full participation with contact. Your fifth and final step is to be cleared for game return full participation. Uh, the reason the full participation with contact and the game are two separate things is we want to get you into a game set or a practice setting. I apologize, into a practice setting. And that way, if a coach or anybody else is noticing anything going on, we can step out and say, hey, hey, stop everything. Step off the field for a second. Let's check you out. It's a little more difficult to do that in a game scenario. So we want to run you through a dry scenario before we put you in a full-fledged game. Um, but like I said, each one of these is a 24-hour step progression. We want to make sure that none of the symptoms that we listed, the, the cognitive, the physical, the emotional, all those things, we want to make sure none of those come back during or after activity. We've had um, athletes who pass, you know, they get to stage two where they can increase their heart rate, and then they start doing some drills. Example is a basketball player. Get her heart rate up, no problem running in a straight line, but get her with the ball and have her have to chase the ball and look across the court. She couldn't do it. Headaches all over again, same, you know, same symptoms. So we stall that person out and say, okay, you can't, you know, you progressed to number two and you got there okay, but you couldn't do number three, so you don't keep going. You stay at number two and, and keep, you know, periodically every day or every other day, try the number three level and say, okay, you know, and, and her example was she could shoot, but she couldn't go chase the ball. I mean, she's like standing at the free throw line, and she could shoot it, but she goes after balls that other people are, are shooting. She just couldn't do the quick, you know, change of direction of her eyes to follow the ball. 
And, but it wasn't the heart rate, it was the eyes. And we didn't really mention very much about eyes. And eyes being able to follow things is really important for two reasons. One is a lot of sports require you to follow with your eyes. But to take notes in class, you got to look down and you got to look up at the board. You look down, take your notes, and look up at the board. And if that triggers your headaches, because it may, so eye motion makes a big difference in in um, concussions. And that's one of the things actually we test when they're in the office. If that's a trigger, like it was a trigger for this basketball player, couldn't do it. That's really important, so especially to look down, look up for schoolwork. But we'll stall you out if you're if you're making it to a certain level. We'll stall you out and say, okay, you can't progress because you can't progress. Um, we also will let the athletes do like stage two, which is increasing your heart rate, but not you know a sport specific. We'll let you do that as long as you cleared your symptoms. You can progress to there before we see you back necessarily. So um, an example is your child has their symptoms clear. We usually talk about this in our office visits, but their symptoms clear. You, and we say, you can progress through stage one, which is low level exercise, and stage two before I see you back. If you're successful at stage two, then I want to see you back, and then we'll do the neurocognitive test to see if post-exercise challenge, you're still on your game as far as your mental functions. Does that make sense? So we'll let you go through stage one or two, but we really, for three, four, and five, we really want to make sure that we've tested and make sure that they're back ready to go. So my skier yesterday was doing uh, some skiing, but not anywhere near his ability. So I said, okay, you're going to progress this slowly um, and you know start to challenge yourself more because you've passed all your tests and you got to stage two without symptoms. So how can we prevent concussions? And my, my cold hard truth is there's nothing we can do to prevent a concussion 100% from occurring unless you were to live in a bubble and never move. So, um, so there's a lot of things we can do to make sure we are cautious to try to pre prevent the occurrence from happening. So making sure you're wearing seat belts because a lot of concussions occur in car accidents. If your sport that you participate in uses helmets, suggests helmets, or requires helmets, use the helmet. Uh, and that also extends out to mouth guards as well. Mouth guards aren't going to prevent it, but they're going to help to absorb some of the shock, and any, every little bit can help count. Uh, never drive under the influence of alcohol or drugs, because that's potentially going to put you at a risk for a car accident and possibly a concussion. Avoid slips, trips, and falls, um, throw rugs, ice, clutter, things like that. It's extremely important when you're talking about really young kids that are developing coordination, as well as the elderly that are having difficulty with coordination. Uh, use handrails when possible. And maintain your physical activity to, to maintain your, your strength and your balance of your body. The, the better in shape you are, the less likely that a slip, a trip, or a fall is going to jar your whole body to the point where you may sustain a concussion. So you know, just being smart about the moves that you make throughout your daily life. And the last thing is just some websites. So if you're involved in any youth sports programs, I strongly suggest the first one, the cdc.gov. Uh, backslash concussion. This website, you can request numerous amounts of free material um, regarding sports concussions, youth concussions, all kinds of information. We have a couple of handouts in the next room over there with, the, with their address on it and stuff, but there is a lot of information on this and it's very valuable and there's a form you can fill out to request stuff to be sent to you for free. Uh, the next two uh, web addresses, one is ours for our sports concussion program here at Dartmouth, and then the last one is the impact test website where you can go on and there's a, a large amount of frequently asked questions about the impact test and what they're testing and, and how to get it brought to you, um, to, your, to or your organization, school, or any function like that. Additionally, we want to let you know that if you're involved in any school um, or youth organization for sports and you ever want someone to come and speak for your to your organization to help educate your coaches, your teachers, school nurses, anybody about how to manage concussions, don't hesitate to contact us uh, and we're more than happy to help send someone out to, to help educate and spread the word about concussions um, so that people are getting the proper management and aren't rushed back. Um, so primarily, you know, if we, teachers are generally one that, that don't understand how a concussion can impact school. So we're, we're more than welcome to come educate anybody. Any questions? What, what type of uh, a toolkit is available for a quick 15 second, 30 second window to see if the child should be removed from activity? I would say your intuition more than anything. Whoever saw whatever the injury was says, wow, that looked like a hard hit. 
that's good intuition and you should consider keeping that kid out. That that's, if you're going to use one thing above all else, it's, it's, that didn't look right. And like we said, in that 15 to 20 seconds, they may not exhibit any of those symptoms yet. So if your gut's telling you to sit them, sit them for that day, reevaluate them later on, you know, get them to someone else a little higher level if, if you're not able to do it yourself or whoever's on the sideline. Uh, but if your gut's telling you, I mean, as an athletic trainer, I've been doing this for years, and I can't tell you how many times I've just been like, you know what, I can't even think twice about this, I'm just going to sit them. And I've, I'm dealt with some parents that are not happy that their student's playing, for sure. I've, I've dealt with numerous parents that aren't happy that I sat their kid for the day. But in the long run, I don't regret a single one of them. So definitely your intuition. That's not what you thought we were going to say. No. <laughs> it's, it's a hard decision to make. It's, 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 you know, yeah. There are states where they're, they're asking the officials to make that decision, which I think is really difficult for the officials to make. Um, but that's, that's the law for some sports, particularly football in some states. And you're putting a you know, person who has no medical background necessarily really on the spot for that. And I think that's really unfair. Um, there you go. That would be yeah, you. <laughs> I, I would definitely look at, you know, get some education on it, but become familiar with either the SAC test or the SCAT too. You know, they're not going to it's not going to be a 15, 20 second evaluation, but it's going to be a short term. Um, and, and the more education you have, the, the better you're going to feel about being able to make those decisions. The official could potentially do a quick little, one of these little quick yeah. little balance things. Yeah. You know, you want to do nothing else, you don't even have to ask him, you know, any questions. Just say, all right, stand on one foot and close your eyes with your hands on your hip, which is the third, sort of third level, 20 seconds. And you might have an answer if they're sort of all over the place. You might not because they might not have a balance problem. That's, also, yeah, that's the hard one. So, if you see something and you think something's wrong, you're probably right, something is wrong. So, like, talking to me, I know the trainer, like, he was talking to me, I was like, so, like, if, and yeah, fogginess. I not see that because they're already on the yeah. sideline. But. Yeah. Definitely one in doubt, sit them out. Mm. What do you see about multiple concussions? That's a hard one because well, I don't think we have any really good data out there to say multiple concussions in what time frame makes a difference. There are plenty of things coming out about NFL. I guess we're, our time is up, about the NFL um, and, you know, recurrent concussions, recurrent concussions, and these guys are suicides, they they're, um, have what's called um, chronic uh, traumatic encephalopathy, um, their brains are messed up, and was that because they were returned too many times when they, you know, you have a game on next Sunday, you have a concussion on this Sunday, I don't care, you're going back to practice on Tuesday, and you're going on Sunday because that's the way it is, you know, so was that because they were not adequately rested? It's hard to know, um, but we really just we don't have any good data to say cumulative concussions. There are the ones that give us uh, give us the willies. You know, this hockey player, this is concussion number four. It's taken five months for each of the you know for at least one of the previous ones, and two months for one of the other previous ones. And we're thinking, how are you on the cello? You know, I mean, we got to think about what are your other skills. And I have said said that to some people. What are your other skills? You know, are there something else you're good at? Because you know, I don't know how many you've had. But five months is a long time, and it sort of gives us the willies. But we're making a decision not based on data. We're ba making it based on it gives us the willies. And I, I, I always know, tell athletes know. and families, we can replace shoulders. We can replace knees, hips, ankles. We cannot we and will never be able right. to replace a brain. So when in doubt, sit them. Yeah, really, it's not worth it. Like, I was mad at that trainer for sitting me out. But after five months of, like, looking at a page and having no idea what it says at all, you're glad that you were sat out. And, like, even if a kid is, like, back in a week, if they had that experience, they would be glad, too. So even if they're mad, <laughs> yeah. better be safe than sorry. All righty. Thanks for coming. Thank you guys so much. Okay,